So turn to John chapter 8, if you will. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 643. If you didn't bring your Bible and you want to follow along, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. If you don't own a Bible, please just raise your hand, get one, keep it. It's our gift to you. But uh, John chapter 8, page 643. Today we're going to start a new series, a tough series. This, this uh, story we are about to read must be the framework for the next five weeks. If this story does not become the framework for our conversation, the next five weeks we're on the risk of, of dividing this church instead of uniting us. So please listen carefully to this story. John chapter 8, page 643, starting with verse 1. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, this has to be the context for our series. This, this is a pact we all need to make right now, not just for this message, but for the whole series. You all received a stone or should have received a stone when you came in. If you didn't, don't worry about it. You can still kind of do this in your mind. But if you receive that stone, grab that stone right now. I want you to hold it in your hand. And as you feel the weight of it, as you hold that in your hand, I'm going to lay the ground rules for this series, okay? First, this, is, this series is not opinion. This isn't just my opinion or, or, or the church's opinion on these issues. If you're hoping to get my opinion on them, I'm sorry. I'm not going to take sides on these issues. I'm not going to support one side or the other. We're simply going to share what does the Scripture say? What does the Word of God say so that we can quit tiptoeing around these issues? Once we proclaim what Scripture says, that just leaves every one of us in the room with one decision. Do I believe this is the Word of God or not? So that's what we're going to start. It's not opinion. Second, you are not right. And by the way, neither am I. Uh, whatever your viewpoint on these issues, whatever you were taught growing up, we're probably all off a bit somewhere. So let's just let grace be our guide. Let's just show grace to each other as we process through these tough topics over the next five weeks. The only one who's right here is God. And the only truth here is his word. Third, and this one has to do with this message in particular, this sermon is not about homosexuality. Now that's the topic that you asked us to address, but really that isn't the issue that needs addressing. The real issue is human sexuality, and that affects all of us. So if you're here and you're hoping for a message about homosexuality where you could point the finger and be out of the crosshairs, think again. Finally, we have to drop our stone. That's where we have to begin. And so the ushers are going to come around with buckets, and every one of us has a choice to make right now. How will I approach the next five weeks? Am I going to come defensive? Am, am I going to come guarding my position? Or am I going to come, am I going to hear the voice of God and let the voice of God, let his words determine my position? Because here's the reality. In the next five weeks, every one of us in here will have an opportunity to judge. We'll all have an opportunity to walk out. We'll all have the opportunity to be offended. We'll all have the opportunity to point the finger. Right now, as we begin, I need you to make a choice. If you are in this room and you are without sin, keep your stone. But also, if you're here and you're without sin, you don't need to come back because you don't need us. You got it all figured out. But if you're like the rest of us and you're not without sin, drop, it, drop your stone. Drop it in the bucket as they pass and make a pact. Make this pact. For the next five weeks, I will choose to not get angry. I won't get offended. I won't leave the church. I won't start nasty Facebook or Twitter posts about the church. I won't walk out in the middle of a sermon. I won't judge any group or any situation that we talk about. And I will choose to not feel judged. The reality is that none of us is without sin. So as the band leads in this song, as the buckets are passed, I challenge you to drop your stone. Thank you for choosing right now to approach this in a way that allows us to just begin to have the conversation. In a place that says it's all 
it's all open for discussion. It's all level. So thank you for your maturity in that. With that out of the way, let's get started. Today we're talking about human sexuality. Now, I know preaching on this topic at all will lead some to think the worst of us. Some will say, I'm being too hard on the issue. Some will say, I'm being too soft on the issue. My goal is not necessarily to please either of you. My goal is not to uh, offend anybody. It's also my goal is not to not offend anybody. My goal is simply to just present the scripture. What does God's word say on these issues? Uh, We will not cover everything in this topic. Uh, I I won't answer all your questions on this issue. I know a lot of people uh, have angst about this. I know there are parents in the room who are struggling with the decision of a a child. I know that there are individuals in this room who are living with the reality of same-sex attraction in your life. Even in in my own self, I'm caught up in the middle. On the one hand, as a pastor, called to stand on Scripture, and on the other hand, as someone whose own extended family is touched by the realities of homosexuality. So let me be very clear right off the bat. This isn't simple. This isn't a simple issue. Human sexuality is has become a hot-button issue culturally. No doubt there's been a seismic shift, particularly in the last 10 years. You know, Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, has done interviews. He's on the cover of Vanity Fair magazine. Is currently on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine. Uh, has received acclaims and also curses. And by the way, not just from the religious community. This is far from just a religious issue. There's a feminist author named Eleanor Burkett, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota, who writes the following about Jenner's choice. This is her words. She says, now that Bruce has taken advantage of male privilege for the last 65 years, now he wants to transition into a woman. People who haven't lived their whole lives as a woman shouldn't get to define us. That's something men have been doing for much too long. Wow. Right? So this is clearly a hot-button issue, not in just religious circles, but in our culture. And whether or not you agree with ESPN, uh, that, that Jenner is the most courageous person in sports, or you disagree completely, whatever side of the issue you're on, one thing is certain. This conversation divides. So let me remind you again, I'm not sharing my opinion. We're simply going to ask ourselves, what does the Word of God say about this kind of thing, particularly about the issue of homosexuality today? So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, if you will. We'll be on page 3 in our Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, page 3, verse 27 says this, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so what does that verse say? The answer is, it depends on your perspective. Let let me illustrate. How many of you are uh, professional football fans? Was the last Super Bowl great or what? The answer is, depends on your opinion, right? (laughs) Depends on your perspective. If you were cheering for the Broncos, it was amazing. Peyton Manning is the man. I knew he had it in him. Cam Newton's a showboat and a crybaby, right? If you were cheering for the Panthers, it was terrible. Peyton was a joke and the defense saved him. Cam Newton couldn't get a break, and the refs were obviously favoring Denver, obviously, right? (laughs) Here's the point. We all bring our perspective to the table, okay? Now, as a church, we hold a traditional Christian perspective, because I don't know if you know this, we're a church, and churches hold a traditional Christian perspective, or they should. When it comes to sexuality and marriage, um, I know in many minds that makes us you know, ignorant at best, hateful at worst. I don't actually think that we're either, but I think regardless of your perspective today, personally, let's find something we can all agree on. Can we all agree on this statement that people matter? Amen. People matter to us. People matter to God. We are all God's creation. He cares about you. Okay. So today I just want to give you though a quick synopsis synopsis of the two main perspectives on the sexuality issue. They're not the only perspectives, but they're the two main ones. First, is the traditional Christian view of sexuality, okay? This was what was taught in the church almost unanimously until about 40 years ago when a major shift in culture began occurring. This goes all the way back to the passage we looked at in Genesis. It's affirmed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, and it's the idea that sexual union in God's creation, it's, that it is God's creation, uh, and that it's much deeper than a social interaction. In fact, the picture that we see over and over in Scripture is that God designed human sexuality for two reasons, pleasure and procreation. Okay, let's look at Genesis 1, and 28. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. The point of this passage is that God has a design for human sexuality. Now, sexuality is a gift from God. It's not a curse. It's not an invention of the devil. 
God made sex and it is awesome, okay? But Holtman Bible Dictionary says this, sex was made for marriage relationship, it was meant for enjoyment and procreation, it was designed as an expression of companionship between one man and one woman from the beginning. So sexuality is meant to have binding power. In God's design for sex, it's to be done within a loving, lifelong relationship of marriage. It's to bind one couple together, which is why he designed it for the parameters of marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 tells us, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So this is God's design for sexuality. According to Scripture, all, listen, all non-marital sex falls outside of God's design. When we remove it from the marriage relationship, it doesn't get easier. It actually complicates it. In fact, try to make uh, any relationship, try to make sex the foundation of any relationship and see how long it lasts and how well it goes. It just doesn't go well. And God didn't do this to place a burden on us. His design is always for our best. The problem is we don't all see it that way. C.S. Lewis says there's no getting away from it. The Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. Listen to Lewis's words in, in a article. Um, uh, 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 article called Men, on, Men of Integrity, Volume 1. He said, chastity is the most unpopular of our Christian virtues. Now, again, this is simply expressing a biblical view of sexuality. And some today will say, well, that Christian ethic is outdated. Monogamous gay marriage is within the bounds of Scripture. Uh, typically, when you really press those arguments, they don't hold up scripturally any, anyway. The traditional view is that gender is an essential distinction, that marriage is one man, one woman for life. That's the traditional biblical view. The second view we're going to look at today is what's called the cultural modern view of sexuality. In this view, sex and marriage are not linked to children and family. Now, children and family might be a part of it if you want, but ultimately sex and marriage are about one thing, personal expression and fulfillment. That, that thinking is a product of the Enlightenment, um, and the idea here is that once procreation is removed from sex, now marriage is just one narrative towards personal fulfillment, but it might not be the one that you choose. I would argue this is where uh, our culture is. It's where many evangelical churches actually are. Uh, the church has largely stopped teaching the Bible and for the most part taken on the sexual ethic of the world, which has changed how a lot of Christians view marriage. Because now if this whole sex thing is a call to personal fulfillment, and then the church is telling me I can't do what personally fulfills me, that's not political anymore. Now that's personal. You add to that the world's view on sex that we can't live without it. Even, even the church Here's something the church is guilty of. The church has so elevated the marriage relationship in the midst of all this that there's a false assumption that to be single is to be broken. The lie is that to be single is to be broken. Uh, and, and, you know, single people, I'm, I'm sorry for that. That's not a scriptural idea at all. It's a cultural one, but it's one that we fully bought into. One writer puts it this way. The real scandal is not homosexuality. The real scandal is celibacy. Now, that's a far cry from what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. This is what Paul says. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, then they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. So Paul says, listen, get married if you can't help yourself. That's Paul's stance on marriage, okay? He says, it's better if you're single like me. Life's just you know, easier. But it, if you're, it, it's better if you're not married. But if you can't handle it, if you can't control your lust, if you're that way, you may as well get married so you're not sinning. Now, I don't think most people buy into that vision of marriage in our day. But Paul's saying, if you can't help yourself, but the church has so elevated marriage to a standard it just can't obtain. obtain. Like the, the marriage is the thing that completes you. When married people, we know it doesn't. Only Christ does. So these are the two perspectives on sexuality. And they're by no means the only perspectives, but for the sake of our discussion today, they're the two major viewpoints out there. Now, again, we're a church, so Ransom holds a traditional biblical view. Now, you may personally be there, you may not be there. That's not the point. Here's what breaks my heart, and I would argue what also breaks the heart of God. Both parties are guilty of making this issue about something that it's not about. This is not about homosexuality. This is about human sexuality. Again, can we all agree with this statement that every human being is capable of bending God's truth to benefit ourselves, right? We, we're all there, every one of us. Church, I think we're guilty of this, okay? This is the point when I was writing this message that I tried to find anything else to do. 
right? I got to, I was writing this and I, I warmed up my lunch. I visited every one of my coworkers. Uh, one of my, one of the, uh, the other guys on staff, we'd been playing a chess game. Seven months this chess game lasted. I won. But, um, but you know, every two, or, every two or three days, one of us would make a move. I made a move that day. I mean, anything I could do to, to distract myself. And I, 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 you know, I wrestled through these things, and a mentor of mine had recently preached on this issue, and I thought, when he did, I thought, you're crazy poking that bear. Uh, and yet, here I was, feeling called to write this message and preparing to share some of these thoughts. It took me a long time to actually type this stuff. But I, church, can I just be honest? I think we need to have this conversation, Right? As this gets to be a bigger political and cultural issue, people have actually emailed me. And they said, when are we going to preach on this? When are we going to preach on how uh, our nation is redefining marriage before our very eyes? That's not happening. Listen, church, we've been doing it for years. This weighs on me so heavily. By the way, I, I can hardly breathe right now. The conversation we're having, this is not a conversation about an unbelieving world redefining marriage in an unbelieving way. Of course they're doing that. This conversation is about the church as a whole who has been redefining marriage for a long time and honestly uh, thinks nothing of it. And I have, I can't tell you how many times in prayer that I have wrestled with this and I've been broken and I've asked God, what do I do? How do I address this tough reality? And in my prayer life, I felt like God said, just rip the band-aid off just rip it off. So here we go. Church, we look at the homosexual community and we're angry at them for redefining marriage. But every time you have a sexual encounter with someone outside of marriage, you are redefining marriage. Every time that we cohabitate, we live together and we do married things and we're not married, you are redefining marriage. Every time you cheat on your spouse, you're redefining marriage. Every time two Christians casually divorce, you're redefining marriage. Every time you open a pornographic magazine or look on a pornographic website thinking it's just images, it won't hurt anything, you're redefining marriage. Every time a Christian marries a non-Christian, you're redefining God's design for marriage. Not my design, not my plan, God's design and his plan. And we've been doing it for years and looking the other way. And people will say, well, what about 1 Corinthians 6, Pastor Phil? And I, what about it? Let's go there together. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are, made pro- are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or, or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And, and people read that, Christians read that and say, see? And I say, see what? It says right there, practice homosexuality. But they completely ignore what comes before that. Those who indulge in sexual sin. Listen, God has a very narrow plan for sexuality, his plan. And anything outside that plan is sin. So maybe, church, maybe instead of the pointing the finger, we need to go first have a conversation with God and be honest with ourselves. Maybe if we got ourselves right, we could have a clearer message to an unbelieving world. You see, this is not about homosexuality. It's human sexuality in general. And I can't tell you how I have wept over this, begging God in these moments to give you ears that could hear this message and get convicted without being offended. And may I add, check your heart, because if on the inside you're cheering right now, you're missing the point. The point is this, go clean up your life before God so that God rules the center of your life so that you actually have his heart for broken people and the light of your life would shine in a way that an unbelieving world would take notice of. Ron Sider in Christianity Today said, this cannot be understated. Again and again, the Bible affirms the goodness and beauty of marriage between one man and one woman, and at the same time, it consistently condemns the immorality of sexual acts, heterosexual and homosexual, that do not honor that bond. You know what that says? It says the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's what that says. So let's ask the elephant in the room question. Are homosexuals going to hell? That's a dumb question. No, no, that's not a dumb question. That's a naive question. That's a short-sighted question. Uh, Listen, the teaching on sexuality in this book, both heterosexual and homosexual, the teaching on sexuality is crystal clear for all of us. But the issue of sexuality in our culture is not nearly as simple. When the Bible talks about same-sex sexual acts, it doesn't directly speak to those attractions. 
And this might be the biggest area in our society that makes us so us versus them. Uh, I've had so many conversations, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who struggle with homosexuality. They love God. They want to honor him. But these struggles are real. They are not imagined. And some of them will say, well, God has, I used to struggle with it. I prayed God delivered me from that lifestyle. Others will say, I, I prayed about it. I struggled for 50 years and I, I, God's never delivered me. So I've chosen, I want to honor God. I've chosen to live a celibate life. I'm not having sex because I want to honor God. Others will say, I've wrestled with this and I've come to the conclusion that God's okay with it. Wherever you come out, this is where scripture differentiates, okay? The Bible speaks to actions, not attractions. The Bible speaks to actions, not attractions. Here's what I mean. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 again. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Now watch. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or who commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or who practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Key words there, indulge and practice. These attractions aren't in themselves any more sinful than my uh, temptation towards pornography. This, where scripture comes into play, where it becomes black and white, is what do I choose to do with those temptations? How do I act on the feeling? What, how, what do I entertain in my thoughts? What do I do with my hands? What do I do with my mind? Corey Kleinsaucer is a pastor and friend of mine. He was actually in first service. He's on sabbatical and was visiting with us. And he did a lot of research on this issue that he allowed me to share with you. Uh, and and, and he found that there's more than one layer at, when you're talking about the, the, the sexual attraction issue, there's more than one layer at play. The first layer is same-sex attraction. This is so often not chosen, and when it first comes, to be honest, a lot of people are, it's confusing. The second level is same-sex orientation. That's where you begin to realize that you actually have a stronger ongoing attraction to the same sex. It's not just that you have same-sex attraction, but it's actually stronger. You have a gay or lesbian orientation. The third is sexual identity. When people start to identify as a homosexual, listen, while the first two are not chosen, identity is. Because identity is always chosen, and by the way, it's not chosen in a vacuum either. We all choose our identity based on who in large part we can identify with, based on the group we feel comfortable with, the group we feel most accepted by. The more accepted we feel, the more likely we are to identify with that people group. We see this in, in Scripture all the time. First John chapter 3, verse 1. See how much our very Father loves us, for He calls us His children. That's our identity. And that is what we are. You see it? 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And all of you together are Christ's body. It's our identity. And each of you is part of it. We're part of it. That's what we're identified with. Christians find their identity in Christ alone. That's God's plan. We don't find our identity in our moral performance or our political stance or our status in life, how much money we have in the bank, our sexual orientation. We don't find our identity there. We find our identity in Christ alone. Listen, when you respond to what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, every other identity has to take a back seat because none of them are big enough. They are all too small to define us. You are not just that. You are more. You are a child of the King. The point is, is there room in the body of Christ for homosexuals, for those who struggle with same-sex attraction or even gender identity? Listen, as a heterosexual, I don't have the right to underestimate those struggles. I mean, put yourself, heterosexuals in the room, put yourself in, imagine struggling with these issues, especially in the church, and facing them inside a church that you know holds a traditional biblical view. How hard would that be? If the church cannot compassionately and lovingly tell you there is a place for you to wrestle that out here, then no, they will, people struggling with that will not identify here. And when they don't identify here, where will they identify? Wherever they feel most accepted. Preston Sprinkle sums it up well. Preston Sprinkle is the vice president for Eternity Bible College's Boise Extension. He's also co-author of Erasing Hell with Francis Chan. And he writes this on this topic. Gay and lesbian people have been sinned against, and it's time for the sinners, straight evangelical Christians, to repent. Not every straight Christian is guilty, and not every church has transgressed God's law of love, but many have. Gay people have been mocked, shunned, abused, verbally if not physically, persecuted, dehumanized, unloved, and like the lepers of Jesus' day, untouched. 
I have many friends who are gay, and their narrative almost always contains the same plot. I was raised in the church, but I was treated like some other. When I was searching for Jesus, I was pushed to the margins by his followers and made to feel like some subspecies to the human race. I didn't find love in the church. Rarely were my gay friends overwhelmed by love and acceptance and grace in the church. Now listen, and it wasn't the church's stance against sin that pushed them away, but its dehumanizing posture against people. Ransom, I think we can do better. There is room for a community of faith to allow for those who struggle with this reality while at the same time holding a traditional biblical view. Now the world will tell you that's not possible. The world has redefined hatred. If I love you, I agree with you. If I disagree with you, I hate you. That's what culture says. It's not true. Don't believe that lie. There is absolutely a place where I love you and I disagree can coexist. Can you be a homosexual and a Christian? Yes, absolutely. Does that mean that the Bible condones and says it's okay, that homosexual behavior is okay. No, it doesn't. Just because Scripture doesn't condone a behavior doesn't mean you condemn the person caught in it. It is absolutely possible to uphold a traditional Christian sexual ethic and still make church a safe place for those who struggle. So how do we respond? How do we respond as a church? Well, answer is the same way you respond with anything else. You walk with each other. You talk to each other. You do life together. You share your struggles. You listen to each other. I mean like really listen to each other. Try to understand. And then both of you together apply God's truth to your story. We all have to stop finding our identity in things other than Christ. And so whether that's our sexual identity or living through our kids or our money or our status, you are bigger. You are more than all of that. Your identity is as a child of the King. You are made in the image of God. That is who you are. Now, the truth is, this is probably, no, not probably, this is the toughest toughest sermon I've ever preached. It's the toughest subject in our culture. And and probably everyone in the room's mad at me. Something I'm too liberal, something I'm too conservative, right? But the only way to avoid that is to avoid the issue. And the truth is, we have to deal with this. This is a real, we can't ignore that. Listen, Orlando happened. And it happened because of fear, and it happened because of hate. And I sat back and I listened and I watched as the church in general in the United States responded and in large part responded poorly. And then I watched, of all people, a corporation, Chick-fil-A. I watched them be Jesus. Chick-fil-A gets all kinds of flack for never opening on Sunday. For the first time in the history of their organization, they called in employees on Sunday but they didn't open their doors. They just made a bunch of food. And then they went to the hospitals and the clinics where these victims were being treated and they fed them and they fed their families. Folks, that's what dropping stones looks like. We can ignore this all we want. We can pretend, we can put our, cover our eyes, close our, just hope it goes away. It's not going away. And so we have a choice. Will we ignore it? Or will we face it? And rather than face it and let it divide us, can this be a a place where we can navigate this together in unity? That's my prayer. That's my prayer. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, obviously I'm emotional right now. Uh, This issue hits very close to home. And it's not easy. But either your word is your word or it's not. And your word commands a couple of things. It says certain behaviors are right, certain behaviors are wrong. Not just homosexual, but heterosexual as well. Are we going to pay attention to that or not? On the other hand, it says God is love. God is love. Are we going to listen to that or not? And what I pray for is the courage as a church, as a body, to navigate this with a combination of truth and love. God, would you give us the courage to actually live like Jesus. To say to the world around us, if, if, hey, if you, you want to judge, if you're guilty, you, if you're sinless, you throw the first stone. To, to be able to say to those around us in, in the same sentence, neither do I condemn you and go and sin no more. Let us stand on the truth 
But let us stand on the truth in love, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.